About five or six months ago, I made this double bass out of holocord doors and some fence boards and some pallets, and I wanted to do a quick update video to let you know what's happened to it over the course of a, now its second season change that it's gone through. Uh, I was just happy that it worked. I didn't even really expect it to last, but so far, knock on wood, so good, it's surviving. Uh, but a couple things have gone wrong, so let me just show you those real quick. You can see here that the fingerboard started to sort of uh, potato chip, they might call it, or curl up on the end here. Now I used the Kumaru decking, uh, and actually it's a pretty bad piece too, it has a bad spot in it. Uh, ironically, not maybe ironically, on that side. Um, and you can see how that just sort of curled up and is reaching the strings. And this does happen to some inferior fingerboards, the ones that are made out of ebony especially. It's a bummer. Uh, I could always make another fingerboard for it because I did hide glue it on. What I did for now is I just simply raised the action up on that side and so it is playing pretty well. And you'll also see that the carved top, under the pressure of the strings, has gotten a little bit flatter than I wanted it to be. I mean, I expected it to sort of compress, especially being a softer, lighter wood than what is probably typically used in this type of an instrument. Um, but it's really under a lot of strain. However, it is holding up and it is not moving. Once it's settled in where it is, it is staying there and it is working, which is uh, incredible. I've left it under full tension this whole time. You can also see here on the bottom, um, I, the end pin is a... Is a friction fit into this end block, this tail block on this instrument. And I glued the tail block in with high glue. And um, when I was pounding the friction fit of the end pin into there, uh, I I didn't make the hole big enough. It was too tight of a fit and I kept hammering and I, I always, <laughs> man, hammers, that would be the end of me. But um, so I ended up kind of busting that glue loose a little bit. And when I put it together and I finished the video and I left it like that for a while, and what I saw happen was that because it, that seam was compromised, it sort of started to crush in a little bit under there. And so I, without taking the whole base apart, I was able to heat up a little bit of the joint, pull it out a little bit, and screw and glue the wood block back into place, and then put the end pin back in. And so now things are a little wonky down there and a little crooked, but it's all working. So the bass still works. So now for the rest of this video, what I wanted to do was take those three original videos that I did and put them together into one master build video so you can watch the whole project from beginning to end. Um, and I edited it down a little bit. It's a pretty long video. Watch it if you want. And if you want to watch the full versions, they're also available still on my channel. And again, I want to thank my three sponsors that helped me make this project possible. Again, Maker Made CNC, ArborTech and GoalierMusic.com. I could not have made this without them. They were huge support to me in so many different ways, and uh, I want to thank them along with all my other people that support me. Uh, you're awesome. Okay, here's the new edit of the video. Be good. So I started by designing the basic shapes in V-Carve, and I made some molds as well. Um, then I moved over to my Maslow CNC um, and used that to cut out some templates, the back of the base, and also these molds that I'm going to use out of uh, three-quarter inch plywood. I thought this was a fun idea. Instead of breaking down the holocord door like I usually do, I just stuck the whole door right on the CNC and I used the cardboard that was inside the door to keep the piece from flying off when it was cut out. And that uh, actually worked out really well for me. Now I'm cutting out out of some scrap pieces of three quarter inch plywood these molds that I'm going to use. And I, I cut the exterior profile of the instrument four times and then I also had the interior profile as waste. I'm a cheapskate and a reclaimer so I, I made this work out of some material that I had left over. And if I were to do this again I would do some things differently here. Primarily I would actually spend a few bucks and get a piece of plywood so all my sizes would be consistent. and. Uh, I wouldn't have little holes in it like you can see there at the bottom of that piece. But now my sides are going to be two layers of eighth inch holocord door skins. So that's a quarter inch. And so this worked out really well. I just used a quarter inch router bit 
and cut it all out and now the two pieces fit together exactly as they will with a quarter inch of material in between them. If you watch my video where I made an acoustic guitar on just the laser using holocore doors, this was the trick I came up with then where I half cut through the wood on the laser to give it a kerf and it becomes like wacky wood. So this gives me the ability to bend it. The whole design revolves around this concept of me taking two layers of this and gluing them together in their bent shape and then they should become somewhat rigid. Now this is my first test of my system with my molds that I made to see if this is even going to work. My whole plan sort of hinges on this working. If it doesn't, there's other solutions, of course, but I really wanted to do it this way. There's no flex at all in it now. I'm gonna keep going, see what happens. I ended up using all my first takes for these parts, um, but if I were to do it again, I would definitely do things different. I would make better molds. Um, they would be probably solid all the way through. I would have them all consistent sizes instead of cutting them out of scraps. I would also change the shape in general, so these molds will never get used again. So I think the better way to do this in the future would be to actually have molds that are all three sections that are individual. So I could mold this part, if this was cut right here and here, I could just go down straight and then cut it to length to fit later. Same here, I could have this go beyond the position that it needs to go, have this go beyond the position it needs to go, and then I could cut them all to fit later. So we're gonna see what'll happen with these. If it doesn't work, I'll go out and I'm gonna keep these molds for doing the final assembly and I'll make some new molds where I section this off into three parts. And then I have to shape the top pieces uh, to make the back slant a little bit because the base is not as wide at the top as it is at the bottom. There's a slight slope to it. I made this quick sandpaper board for sanding out the sides and I made it long enough to reach across the whole instrument because I figured when I get it together I might need that sanding ability as well. I screwed the mold onto my workbench so it would not move and um, I started preparing some more wood for bracing on the interior of the instrument using the trim of the hollow core doors. So these corners were my biggest concern because of the way the molds are made and I decided the best thing to do would just be to glue a piece of solid wood in there to attach them all. Obviously the more pieces we get adhere to each other in the opposite directions and whatnot, the stronger it will get. Uh, however, they weren't quite strong enough for me yet, I felt. So I went in with some CA glue and some scraps of veneer and made these little patches, like a little hinge almost, that did the job. That made me feel confident that everything was going to stay together. Since the whole glue edge is only a quarter inch thick, besides the tail block and the neck block, um, I thought it'd be nice to have a couple other spots that I could get a little more glue adhesion on to attach the back to the side. So I made these little spots uh, to just sort of give me a little extra glue support. Heat and steam are your friends when working with high glue. A warm shop and a steamy shop will help, and steam is good for breaking the joints apart too because it won't cure as fast. If it's cold and dry, the stuff cures really quickly. You don't even have time to glue two things together. So it will be good enough to take the clamps off relatively quickly, but it does need to sit for a little while to really do its job and, and bind up good. I was a little nervous about being able to get all the glue on there and getting it assembled and stuck together fast enough. Um, so I was kind of rushing and feeling the pressure. I ended up having to redo the top half of the base because um, I sort of let that slide while I was working. Um, but it all came together okay. Once I had it together enough to flip it over, I painted the inside seam as well, just for extra adhesion. And then I used a uh, pattern router bit to trim off my excess back. I made a couple of rookie mistakes here that I didn't notice until I flipped this thing over and started looking at it, but uh, I should have just done the sides and not tried to glue the blocks in at the same time because this block was a little bit crooked. And the other thing is, is that since the back slants, this should slant too, so it gets a full purchase and it doesn't, it kind of floats and only the tip is getting there. So I'm going to glue another, some blocks of wood or some wood onto the bottom of this so I can shape it in to fit this body and then line it all up nice and straight, glue it in and then clean it all up. And my tail piece, I think I'm going to be okay. Um, we'll find out. That all works pretty well. And then from some of my hollow core door cutoffs from the trim, I started making some of the bracing pieces that I would put on the inside of the instrument to keep it from just collapsing under the tension. And we'll talk more about some of that stuff later too. This wide piece was book matched from one of the bottom pieces of the door. 
And that's what the inside of the base looks like at this point. Um, it is all 100% hollow core door except for the neck block and the tail block. Those are from pallet wood ash. So I had this ash that I had scored from these giant pallets at a steel yard near me that I decided to plane down and glue together to form the block that I would carve my neck from. I also brought my 1930s aluminum base into the shop so I had something to reference for some basic measurements and angles. The neck wants to go into the body. It doesn't go in like straight at a 90. It goes at about a 76 degree angle so it's tilting up a little bit to give the strings to go up over the bridge and we get that angle and that down pressure going on. Uh, I want to put in the block on the body of the guitar a dovetail and I want to have at the bottom of the neck another dovetail so I can slide them together. Traditionally they would be glued together like this um, but I want to run a bolt through mine so I can remove the neck if I ever want to take it apart to travel. You can see here I have both most of the math basically figured out. Um, this is a neck that was cut off before. There needs to be a block of wood here that goes out over the body. Here's that angle I was talking about and here's where I want that dovetail. So I could cut it on the table saw like I did here but it gets tricky because I have to have a stop here and it's going to be at an angle so I'm not sure if that's going to be something that I'm going to be comfortable doing all those compound angles. So instead what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a block like this, get my nice dovetail on it and then glue it into my assembly here. That will give me a piece of wood with an alternating grain which will add to my structure and stability and then I'll just have some very basic math to work that in, I think. It seemed the best way to do this large format sliding dovetail was on the table saw and it took a few practices but I, I figured it out. It was easy to make both shapes, the male and the female. The tricky part was getting them to fit together correctly. In my previous attempts I kept making the fit too loose um, so this time I just aired on the other side and made it a little too tight and then I kind of cleaned it up by hand. And I feel like that's actually going to really help the structure of that fragile part of the instrument. Now it was time to carve out and shape the neck. So first that required cutting off most of the excess on the bandsaw. And I, I was very obsessive about my measuring in this process and really taking it slow and doing little bits at a time. The tailstock was too tall for my bandsaw, so I wasn't able to cut that out there. I instead cut as much as I possibly could, and then I finished it off by hand and with uh, hand planes and sanders, the stuff that I couldn't cut cleanly. I used the Arbortech turbo plane to rough in the contours and shape of my neck. This tool is very aggressive and it's designed to be used with the guard on the angle grinder, which you can see I am not using. Make sure to use your own discretion, know your tools, and know your comfort level before doing anything dangerous with dangerous tools. I also use the Arbortech mini carver to get into some of the tighter areas, and then I will use that in a little bit to carve out my headstock design. Now with the neck shaped out, it was time to do the headstock. I cut the angle in that goes there, and there's like a pocket that all of the tuners go into. It does not go all the way through, so I hogged out most of the material using Forstner bits. You can see it tapers in as it goes. And then I saved my cutoff scrap so I could clamp it safely into my vise and clean up the rest of it with a chisel. The tuners are a tapered shape to them that the string wraps around, so I needed two different drill bits to drill the first hole that it goes through then the second hole that holds the end. Now it was time to carve the headstock shape. You can see I screwed that clamp down to my workbench and that held it still. And Then I learned how to use the mini carver. Um, I probably should have done a little more practicing on scrap, but I didn't do much. I jumped right in and I just kind of figured out how to hold it, the best angle to go. And near the end, uh, I started really getting much more comfortable with the mini carver and I fell in love with it. I can't wait to experiment with it some more. I also used the Arbortech contour sander to help me sand some of these tight areas. I drilled a couple holes through the heel and the neck block so I could put those anchors in and bolt it down. It seems alright.
These are some real nice white cedar fence boards that I pulled out of that pile of reclaimed fence boards. I planed them down, but they're not thick enough to carve a whole top, right? They're only about three quarters of an inch thick. So I jointed them all up and I made a couple surfaces that I then glued together to double the thickness to about an inch and a half. This is a little trick I learned many years ago for gluing together panels like that. You'll notice that piece of wood bows out in the center. I had planed the edges down shorter. So now if I apply clamps to either side, the pressure actually gets pushed in the center more than the edges. And that helps to get to places where you might not have clamps that are long enough to get to them. A lot of glue, a lot of clamps around the edge, and then I also use those center clamps to push it down there. So now I'm roughing out the shape of the base and I'm way oversizing it and uh, sort of figuring out where I'm going to put everything to make sure it's going to be able to get glued to the back and sides and fit. So I made a simple template for my F holes and just routed those out. Now you might think it's weird that I'm routing them out first, but there's a couple reasons. One is, is while it's flat, I can get a nice route going. I won't be trying to carve around a corner, even though it would be thinner and I could maybe use a coping saw. But the other reason is so I can see through the side because I don't ever want to go too far uh, while I'm carving. So here's what I did. Besides those holes in the center, on the top, I routed down a lip all the way around the edge, just roughly, of that's my maximum depth to carve the sides on the top where I carve it up. And then on the inside, I drilled holes in the middle for my maximum depth to drill in. So if I plane away the wood to the depth of that hole, I know that my top is about a quarter inch thick. And conversely, on the front side, I know if I plane my upward slope to just that edge lip that I created, I know that I won't get too thin on those edges either. So now it was time to bust out that turbo planer and make a mess. I thought about taking this outside so I wouldn't make such a mess out of my shop, but then I thought, you know what? I'm not a caveman, that's why I have a shop, so I don't have to work outside. <laughs> I just work my shape in, but while I'm using the turbo plane, again, this thing removes a lot of wood quickly, so you really want to take small bites and stop and look and think a lot. Now that the Arbortech tools got me into the ballpark of my shape, I put a just coarse grit sandpaper onto my angle grinder and started to smooth it out and sand the shape in the rest of the way. You can see over on this side, I'm right about where I want to be, about a quarter inch. I can see all around all the inconsistencies, because I was just power carving. And now I go in and finesse it. And right here, this is like, this is where we stop, right there. I think it looks kind of cool how there's those two layers of wood and the grain changes through the carve, but that edge is like really cruddy. <laughs> and uh, so there's some cool and uncool things about this system. The only support that goes into this top is this base bar that runs along the low E string side of the top and it gets carved in. Sometimes they actually just carve it right into the shape of the top so it's all one piece of wood but uh, I thought that was too much for me to try to take on and I glued one on instead with a little bit of creative clamping. And then the other thing that holds the top up under the pressure of the strings is the sound post and you'll see more of that. Of course there's a ton of other sanding to do on the whole body. I had pretty much all of my bracing fit in and I've got some little details I needed to do like cutting out the spot where the neck is going to slide in etc etc. I put this little piece of leftover door from the sides that I made in a spot around where I know my sound post is going to go. Now I'm just about ready to glue the top on and I'm concerned about being able to get glue in and get it all clamped together so I'm doing a dry run first and then I decided that I couldn't <laughs> so I went around a little bit at a time and there's enough flex in the woods where I could do a spot clamp it, brush some glue in, do another spot, clamp it, and um, it worked okay. I wasn't sure if this was going to work or not, but it did. I started trying to sort of chisel it off, but it was still a little too tacky, so I waited till the next day, and then it, the excess chiseled off uh, a lot better, and I was able to just sort of sand and clean up those edges. I also cut some thin strips of my laser cut kerfing to make a band, an edge band, around the instrument. Um, this was a plan from the beginning. Uh, it's not common, but there's really <laughs> not much common about what I'm doing, I guess. 
The goal of this build is to make as much of this base out of reclaimed materials and other people's garbage as I could, but there were still some things that I was just not gonna be able to manufacture for this gig, so that's why I went to Goldier Music. Like, uh, you know, machining these tuners, I mean, that's just, uh, this is the end pin that the base stands on because I have enough to make. Bridge, I actually bought from Goldier about, whew, probably five or six years ago, the last time I did work on my aluminum base, but I was able to continue to use the bridge that was on there, so I never used it. And I have this nut that I had bought there from when I made my first electric base, like 18 years ago, that I ended up never using. And uh, this is a spruce sound post. It's just basically a dowel, but it's a nice aged spruce, and I just bought that so I could have one piece of wood in this instrument be right. <laughs> I was gonna make this bridge, and then I decided since I had this one already on hand, I would just use it, and I wanted to make my own tailpiece. I happen to have this cruddy one on hand that I've already gone and, and CNC'd my own version. You saw me CNC carve out a fingerboard and now it is time to glue it onto the neck. I use a double boiler to heat it up and steam heat is really a great way to keep it uh, workable and to get it apart too. Now that the fingerboard and neck are joined I can do my final fitting and sanding and I also wanted to put a coat of finish on the neck but not the fingerboard. So I tape the fingerboard off and I use this uh, Total Boat Halcyon you can see uh, there's the finished neck, ready to go on the base. Start roughing in my base bridge. I want the feet of it to fit the contour of the top, and the easiest way to do that is use the contour of the top as a sanding block. I sand it to 220 and wipe the whole base down with alcohol to prep it for finish, and then I use that same Total Boat Halcyon finish and I just brushed it on. On the fingerboard and the tailpiece and all the stuff that was made out of reclaimed Kumaru decking like this little block that helps protect the body where the tailpiece gets held on, I just put a little bit of mineral oil and beeswax on it. This is actually one of the trickier parts of this build, not that they any other part has been easy, I guess, but there's a simple post that goes from the bottom to the top of this piece of wood, just like this, that keeps this from collapsing under the pressure of the strings pushing down on the bridge. It's called the sound post. I only get one shot of this. If I cut it too short, I screw it up. If I cut it too long, it pokes up. So I'm gonna use a drumstick to get my measurement and kind of practice a little bit putting this thing in here. It's sort of tricky. So I glued a plate into the top of this of holocore door and then there's also a piece of bracing here, so the depth isn't just the same as the exterior depth. Plus we have an arch, everything gets weird. So what I'm doing is I'm putting my tape measure on the, the back brace that I have in there and measuring to the bottom of my F-hole, and it's about eight and an eighth inches. And then my plate of holocore door is also an eighth of an inch, so I can subtract that from it and I get eight inches. But it does curve up just a little bit more from here, so I'm gonna go eight inches heavy, and I think I'll be okay. This is a cool tool that many of you have probably not seen. It is uh, a sound post setter, and they make them in smaller sizes for the violin and for the cello. Uh, this one is obviously for the bass. So the idea is, as this very sharp end, it's as sharp as a chisel, that you stab the sound post with, which is gonna be difficult with this because it's not spruce, it's this very dense uh, wood, I don't know what it is, hickory. Um, so you stab it with this, and then when you've got this held, you can lower it into the F-hole and sort of get it into place, just sort of wedge it a little bit, and then you can flip it around, and you can use this disc to nudge and push it straight in where it needs to be on both the top and bottom. And uh, it's a real skill. I've only done it a couple times, so <laughs> let's see what goes wrong. This is my practice with a drumstick. Damn it. Fell. The rest of ice pick saves the day again. A couple more practices and I felt like I was ready to do it for real. I'm going to start putting strings on it now even before I have the sound post in because I want to start slowly getting it under tension and then put the sound post in after there's just a little bit of tension on the top. My bridge is a mile high and my nut's not carved in, so the strings are not going to be anywhere near playable, but it's going to start putting pressure in all the places the pressure is going to be, and I can make sure I measure it all up and get stuff in the right spot. 
Now I learned that that dressed ice pick worked really well and so I used that as one half of my sound post setter and that way I was able to two hand it which worked way better than sort of wedging it in with just the one tool and then having to flip it over. So I felt like I had a lot more control this way and it went in really pretty easily like that. Mark also sent me this amazing little tool for just helping to lay out your bridge and your nut. Um, oh my god, it made life so much easier for setting up string spacing and, and making cuts. So you can see I have to bring the bridge down. Um, I started just very roughly setting it up. I'm very slowly bringing this up to tension and this has got to be one of the most stressful things I've ever done because I have no idea if it's just going to collapse or something's going to fly up. There's a lot of pressure in this and everything's settling so I'll tune it up and then it'll shrink, you know, just going very slow. Still got a long way to go on the setup. I'm almost up to pitch now. I put a little bit more effort into shaping the bridge now but it still needs to come off and get some final shaping and, and sanding. I wanted to get the, the base up under tension for a few days and sort of experiment with it before I got too carried away with the setup. I'm going to try and take it off the bench and pluck it for the first time. I think it's almost in tune. I have my tuner on it. I have my action set up pretty good. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to stand here and procrastinate. <laughs> Alive. That was super exciting that it worked. Uh, so I went back in and, and tweaked the setup a little bit more. And like I just said, it's it still needs some more work, but I got it even more playable. And uh, I'm pretty happy about it. it works <laughs> hey I played this bass a little bit in these videos to show that it works but if you really want to hear it go check out my other YouTube channel new perspectives music on that channel I'm doing a shootout where I'm playing this bass my aluminum bass a 1956 K plywood bass and my 1920s fully carved check upright bass under the same microphone in the same situation so we can kind of really give a listen to them and see if garbage can hang with those other instruments so go check that out right now I'm just playing through the camera mic you know Hey, thanks again for watching. This was just a stripped down condensed version of a three part video series. It's uh, I think over an hour long. So if you're looking for more information and more answers, I do invite you to go check out the full length thing. You can also ask questions in the comments below and I do my best to answer them. I can't always answer all of them. And I did just recently start a Wizio page at wizio.com slash Tim Sway, which is like a paid to answer questions type thing. Uh, what it does is um, it guarantees that I will give you an in-depth answer to something in a video form. Uh, personally for you. So go check that out. I'm, I'm just trying out this new service. I'm not sure how I feel about it yet and I'd be curious to see what you think about it. Wizio.com slash Tim Sway. Alright, thanks a lot and be good. And...